spotlight Avalon and me. Um, so welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Brett Phelan. I am the science director for the Harris Center for Conservation Education. We're sponsoring tonight's talk. For those of you who might be new to us, we are a nonprofit based in the Monadnock region of Southwest New Hampshire. And we help people fall in love with the natural world through land protection, conservation research, and education for all ages. So any of you who are local um, might be interested to know that we have protected more than 24,000 acres of land from development. Much of that is open for hiking and firefly watching and other recreation. We coordinate conservation research on our protected lands and really throughout the region um, through a variety of community science projects. And really at the heart of everything we do is education for all ages from babies and backpacks to residents of retirement communities and all points in between. This past year, that's meant a lot of Zoom programs, but we are starting to um, venture back into some in-person outings this summer in addition to Zoom offerings. So I encourage you to check us out. We've got lots of really great events coming up and you can find out about all of them at harriscenter.org. On to the fun part, um, which is introducing tonight's speaker, Avalon Owens. She's a PhD candidate in biology at Tufts University, working to better our understanding of how artificial light at night affects firefly populations and what adjustments we might be able to make to our lighting practices that can help humans and fireflies peacefully coexist for many generations to come. She has an undergraduate degree in organismic and evolutionary biology from Harvard and a master's degree in entomology from National Taiwan University. She also serves on the board of the Zoological Lighting Institute, which sounds like a fascinating organization. So with that, um, I wanna welcome Avalon and welcome everybody. And um, thank you all for being here. And Avalon, take it away. Thank you so much. All right, let me share screen and then get a timer running and then make sure I can see all your beautiful <laughs> names. <laughs> Not very many videos. Um, Hi, everyone. Um, thank you so much for coming and wanting to hear about these incredible insects. Um, as Brett said, I'm a PhD student at Tufts. I study uh, light pollution as a problem and fireflies as sort of a case study of how light pollution can affect the natural world. Um, uh, this is my title slide. I just picked this today. I actually really like it. Uh, paired with this quotation from James Thurber, that there are two kinds of light, the glow that illuminates and the glare that obscures. Um, as far as I you know, think of this, fireflies are the glow that have illuminated my whole academic career. They, they bring us so much um, and I'm no exception. And they're beautiful, magical and great, and they're also really obscured by artificial light sources like this flashlight here. Fireflies are hard to see when there are other lights on at night. And that's the basic substance of what I'm here to talk about today, but I'm gonna try to make it go on for longer than one minute. So uh, here we go. I wanna start with the night sky. So the night sky is just awe-inspiring, right? Much like fireflies, it, they, the night sky, the stars are of immense cultural value. And there's no better proof of that than this constellation map, um, which just shows that we can find a lot of meaning in the stars. And in fact, I was looking at this earlier and I found the outline of my talk. So to walk you through it, um, first, I'm gonna talk about artificial light at night. And then I'm gonna spend a little bit talking about how it affects all insects. Uh, it's kind of a bait and switch. I got you here with the fireflies, but I am going to talk about moths and other insects as well. Um, and then I'm going to, you know, come back to fireflies, which sort of fall at the intersection of these things. They're a combination of light, night, and insect. And then I'm going to dis uh, describe a study that I carried out at the Pennsylvania Firefly Festival, which is this really special place, a special event. Um, I carried that study out in summer 2019, and I'm just going to tell you what I did and what I found. So about light. Uh, this is what the United States looks like from space at night. Obviously, these lights are not natural. They were put there by people. They're things like street lights, house lights, billboards, a whole bunch of stuff, which taken all together makes it really hard for us to see those stars that we just talked about. Today, over 23% of the land surface of the earth falls under an unnaturally bright night sky. And that includes 
most of the eastern half of the United States, as shown here. And if things keep going the way that they have been, this light will eventually cover the Earth. Um, these maps can be a little hard to interpret. So what these colors mean um, is basically shown here. This is the Bortle scale of light pollution. And I would say red uh, sort of represents a pretty bad night sky, the kind that we get around Boston, where you really can maybe see a star or two, but not much. Um, orange is like not great. And then yellow, I think, represents maybe your average spot out in the country where if you stay up late enough, you will see stars, but you're not really going to be able to see the Milky Way. You have to have a really pristine night sky to be able to see the Milky Way. So to go back to this map, you can see uh, most of the US, you know, people aren't able to see the Milky Way where they live, which is really sad. It's a huge cultural loss. Um, and, and so this light uh, artificial light stops us from being able to stargaze in cities. But what's important to realize is that it also impacts habitats that are very far away from cities. So um, this is an example I love. This is the Chacao Culture National Historical Park in New Mexico, I believe. Um, it's an international dark sky park and the park service explicitly like tries to make this place as dark as possible so that people can experience the night sky as the ancestral Pueblo peoples once saw it. Um, this is the Milky Way, by the way, some of you may not have seen this in a while. Um, and even here in this totally isolated dark sky park where people go to see the Milky Way, um, you can actually still see a lot of artificial light. If you subtract out all of this natural light from the stars, you can still clearly see the glow of nearby cities on the horizon. And these are, you know, miles and miles away. And that's, it's, it's depressing and it's also, it's also interesting, right? Because looking at the night sky is supposed to make us feel small and yet somehow we've managed to completely transform it, you know, uh, makes you feel very big indeed. So this is, like I said, a little depressing. It does get a bit worse, uh, even in the most remote areas where there is no visible sky glow on the horizon, nothing to get picked up by a satellite. You'll still often get things like this, car headlights and other local sources of light that are too small to be seen from space, but still radically alter the nocturnal environment. Now, I'm not saying we should drive around without headlights, although maybe in the future with driverless cars, anything's possible. Um, but I do think that we can make things better with technology. And the technology I'm talking about is LEDs. <laughs> LED lights have a fairly bad reputation, which is well-deserved, I'd say. As you can see here, they are often so bright and so blue uh, as to seriously offend the eyeballs of anybody nearby. But LEDs can come in any color of the rainbow. And these monochrome LEDs are usually used for you know, festivals and parties, kind of frivolous things, but they might actually be our best way of avoiding certain environmental impacts of artificial light. I'm gonna leave that, put a pin in that. Um, let's talk about what kind of environmental impacts light might have. And to do that, I'm going to talk about how artificial light at night affects insects. A lot of the things I mentioned apply to other animals as well, and sometimes even plants, but I'm an entomologist, so I'm a little bit biased. Um, in my research, I've realized there's sort of five ways in which artificial light affects insects. And I wrote these up in a review paper and then a more recent perspective piece. If you want more information, I'd be happy to email you the links. Um, but I'll just describe them briefly here. So these are my five categories and they have very fancy science names, but I promise you it's, it's really not that deep. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna go through them one by one and each one has a little icon, a little emoji, and it's gonna show up in the upper right corner to keep us sort of aware of what exactly I'm talking about. Mm -hmm. So the first one is called uh, temporal disorientation, which just means that artificial light can interfere with the way an insect perceives time. So for example, um, this is a nocturnal pollinator that comes out at night to forage on flowers for nectar. If it's too bright outside, this moth might think, oh, it's not night yet, and it might decide to wait until it gets dark. But if that's an artificial light, it might wait forever, and it's not going out and doing the things it needs to do. 
Um, on the flip side, uh, here's a picture of leaf miners. These are um, moth caterpillars that live inside leaves. You can see a few of them here. Um, and they have this really interesting life cycle where they spend the winter in a special form. Uh, it's like a cocoon, a very hard cocoon. Um, and like many insects, they use the length of the day to try to figure out where they are in the year so that they can prepare for winter, which is coming. And so if these leaf miners are out and the weather gets colder and colder and colder, but they're in a greenhouse, say, or in a public park with street lights, and the day still seems really long because there are lights on all night, uh, these leaf miners might think, oh, it's still summer, let's not worry about the weather, and they will keep on eating instead of preparing for what's to come, which means ultimately that they freeze to death. Um, so this is, both of these are mismatches in the timing of sort of daily events and seasonal events. And one of the big messages I wanna sort of communicate to you all is that um, we spend a lot of time as scientists, especially as entomologists, worrying about how climate change will, change, will affect the timing of you know, biological interactions, plants, insects, all that. Um, but whenever we worry about climate change, messing with timings, we should also worry about artificial light because it does the same thing. And also I wanna note that the leaf miners over here, they are not nocturnal insects, they come out during the day. And you know what? Light pollution is not just a nocturnal insect problem. And we know this because guess what? We all know that if you stay up late at night scrolling on your phone, it gets hard to sleep. And we know that if you live in New England, the winters seem to go on forever. You can use a happy light to make yourself feel a little bit more like it's summer, right? A little more energy. We are not nocturnal animals. We come out during the day. And so there's no reason to think that light pollution would only affect nocturnal animals. All sorts of animals sleep at night and are affected by artificial light. It's even worse um, for wild animals because they can't close the curtains when somebody leaves a light on. So, um, that's that. Uh, the next topic or the next category, let's say, is spatial disorientation. And what that means is that artificial light can make it difficult for insects to navigate around their environment. So many insects, including this dung beetle here, who is being very cooperative, uh, participating in a study, um, many insects use uh, nocturnal light sources like the moon or the Milky Way to navigate around at night. So dung beetles, for example, when they find a nice ball of dung, you know, and they want to lay eggs in it and make it theirs, they are really interested in getting it as far away from the original source as possible so that nobody else finds it. And so they want to zoom away from where they found it in a straight line. And the way they do that is, is actually incredible. You can find videos on YouTube. Basically, a dung beetle will hop onto the ball, look up, and sort of dance around trying to figure out where the Milky Way is in the sky. And once they have that in their mind, they follow the line of the Milky Way to go in a straight line away from where they were going. Now, the Milky Way is almost completely obscured in many urban and suburban habitats. So what is a dung beetle to do? They're also very endangered, by the way. Could be a coincidence, I'm just saying. Um, so this is a, is a fairly common problem. Um, and actually, it's, it also sometimes results in a very special phenomenon called phototaxis, um, which is movement towards light, also known as flight to light behavior or fatal attraction. And so um, I'll try to explain it briefly like this. Um, so essentially many insects that want to get around at night wanna go in straight lines. And some of them um, will hone in on specific points like the moon. Um, and if a moth wants to go straight at night, it will decide to keep the moon at a constant angle to it up in the sky and sort of go towards it or, or at an angle to it because the position of the moon never changes. Now, what sometimes happens or what we think might happen is that in cities, insects see overhead lights like this and think that they have a moon nearby. And so they decide to place that light at a constant angle. And what that ends up with is they'll do a sort of spiral maneuver and spiral into the light because the position of the light does change as you move. This is one explanation for why insects fly to light. There's a couple others. I won't nerd out about it too much, um, 
but it is a very widespread phenomenon. And in fact, we've known that insects do this for almost all of human history. Um, here's a nice poem um, from a great Sufi philosopher in the 1100s. Um, and actually, this is not the first example of people talking about moths flying to fire. In fact, um, ancient Greek and Roman beekeepers used fire to trap wax moths that were attacking their beehives. So people have known for a long time that insects fly to light, and that when that light is fire, insects will fly to their own death. Now, um, today's lights are not made of fire, and so they usually don't immediately kill insects. Um, and so insects will tend to kind of hang around. They might sit there stunned or, or sort of circle endlessly. And um, that means that, you know, at the advent of electric lighting, a lot of people noticed insects fly to lights and some entomologists were really interested in this. Um, and so uh, entomologists used electric lights to capture insects uh, starting in like the 1850s, but at least in 1900, we had this fellow who um, was an entomologist employed in DC who made a splendid collection of the moths simply by going the rounds of a number of electric lights every evening. And besides making the acquaintance of a number of insects new to him, met several entomologists who like himself had been attracted to the light by an abundance of specimens. As Kenneth Frank pointed out in 1988, today lamps in big cities such as DC, Philadelphia, and Boston are among the worst places to collect moths or meet entomologists. So for whatever reason, these lights don't attract insects the same way that they used to. And so a lot of entomologists have had to specialize and come up with super attractive lights, highly insect specific lights that they use to survey diversity. And so here's an example that was posted to Twitter just yesterday, I think, um, of a light sheet in Japan where they have these special sort of greenish bulbs that also have UV in them. And they use these to attract insects to the sheet where they can go and categorize them. And you'll note that um, Dr. Kawahara says, uh, this is how things should look. And the reason he says this is because there's a growing awareness among entomologists that these things don't work anymore. Um, here's an image from Dan Jansen. This is um, 12 years ago, and this is, I think, last year. Um, and the difference in moths attracted to the same light trap in the same place is just incredibly, you know, it's night and day. <laughs> Literally, <laughs> stupid joke. Um, so why aren't these things working? You know, a lot of people think it's because insect populations are collapsing and we're in the middle of an insect apocalypse. And a lot of the evidence for the insect apocalypse is stuff like this, light traps not catching insects. And I think that is definitely possibly at least partially true. But one of the other reasons that um, we might not see as many insects at these lights is because they've learned that coming to lights is like super dangerous and you usually die. Um, so not always, I mean, sometimes insects collide with a fixture, you know, they burn up, whatever, they die and that, and that happens, but that's probably not the, the major problem. Um, the major problem is that everybody else on the planet has learned that insects fly to lights, and so they go there too. So you get these huge aggregations of nocturnal predators like bats, toads, and spiders. You also get daytime predators that exploit the light. They would usually be asleep at night, but they stay up at the light and they use the light to catch um, insects. So jumping spiders do this, anoles do this, a lot of birds do this. If you've ever been light trapping and left the light on in the morning, you'll see several birds there sort of enjoying the feast. Um, and so coming to a light trap is very dangerous because a, an insect will often die. And even if it doesn't die, it sort of is sitting there all night, not doing the things it normally does. And it's missing out on a lot of you know, important activities like foraging and mating and you know all that. Um, it also, <laughs> This is kind of a theme, it gets worse. Um, so uh, this is an image of mayflies attracted to the lights over a bridge and they're swarming, mating and laying eggs on this road. These eggs are not supposed to be on the road. They're supposed to be in the water underneath the road. Um, so you can see how this is a big issue. And this light is just confusing the mayflies and, and totally could just totally obliterate entire populations in one go. Um, okay. 
fourth category I'll just talk about really quickly. It's called desensitization. It's this idea that we're all familiar with, which is sometimes when you're driving around at night on the highway, you'll see stuff like this, some car with LED headlights that totally blind you and make it impossible to see. I see this a lot. Um, now, we are, like I said, we come out during the day as animals, right? Our eyes are adapted to sort of bright light conditions. Most nocturnal animals have super, super sensitive eyes that are used to sort of scavenging around for whatever light they can find. And so um, when you turn on a light around, for example, a moth or a firefly, that could blind them temporarily or maybe blind them permanently. We don't really know. There's not a lot of research in this area, surprisingly. Okay. Um, final category is going to require a little bit of explanation. So. It's a motorcycle. Please bear with me. Um, okay, I call this recognition. So I want, let's go on an imagination journey together. Um, imagine that you are an herbivorous insect and you come out at night and you're interested in finding a particular species of plant. It doesn't matter what plant species, I just found a lot of good pictures of this one. Um, so at night, the plant might look something like this, kind of bluish, dark, hard to see. But under light of an unusual color, it could be completely unrecognizable. Now, most artificial lights aren't as intensely blue or red as this, but even small differences like between a cool white or a warm white LED could make it difficult for insects to recognize host plants, prey, predators, or conspecifics. And here's where we come back to fireflies because this is probably going to be extra bad for fireflies. Fireflies, are really easy to see against darkness, but their flashes do not show up very well at all against any color of background light. Also, fireflies are red-green colorblind, which makes it even worse. They have a hard time telling flashes apart from sort of background lighting. So maybe it's possible um, that we could find a color of light um, that doesn't affect fireflies so much. See, we're coming back to it. Um, and that's kind of been an idea in the community for a long time that we can use this technology and find a color of light that doesn't have these bad impacts, that the fireflies can still flash, they can still be seen against it, and insects aren't attracted to it, and it doesn't interfere with your day-night cycle as much, and it doesn't have any of these problems. So it has to be some color of light that we can see but other insects can't see, or not other insects, but insects can't see, um, or maybe they just don't respond to it. Um, and that's this is where I come in. Um, so I'll talk about fireflies first. So that's why that's why we're here. Um, I'll be brief since you're all experts because of the previous talk. But <laughs> um, so fireflies are these incredibly charismatic and beloved beetles that come out at night in the summer months in North America. And male fireflies will fly around a habitat and they'll produce these advertisement flashes from this organ, which is called their lantern. Um, they produce these flashes in a specific pattern at a specific time, and they use them to court um, female conspecifics that are waiting below. So the females are sitting on the ground looking up when they see a guy that they like, they flash back. And that's how the, the dance begins. Um, Fireflies produce bioluminescence using a chemical reaction. It's kind of like a glow stick, basically. You have two parts, a luciferase, sorry, a luciferase and a luciferin. And when they come into contact, just like breaking a glow stick, they put out a bunch of light. What's different is that fireflies can control when those parts connect and they can put out light, stop it and put it out again. And I saw at the beginning, somebody was asking for a firefly life cycle. So here you go. Um, we spend most of our time thinking about adult fireflies, but the adult stage is a very, very small part of the firefly life cycle. Fireflies begin as eggs laid on moss or under leaves, and they're in the egg stage for a couple weeks, and then they hatch into larvae. And the larvae can live in a bunch of different places, um, usually underground or under the leaf litter, or sometimes on tree trunks randomly, sometimes in water as well, the very diverse family of insects. Um, but generally they're in the soil, let's say, and they live in the soil for uh, 
up to two years. In New Hampshire, it's definitely two years because it's a lot colder up there. So they're going to take a lot of time to slowly eat and grow and sleep over the winter and eat and grow. Um, and firefly um, larvae are carnivorous. Uh, a lot of people don't know that. These are fearsome predators. They eat things like snails, earthworms, um, and sometimes just random junk, depending on the species. And they take their time uh, eating and growing in the soil. And then after one to two years, they pupate um, near, probably near the top of the soil and then emerge as adults. The adults do not eat. They do not look for any sort of habitat, really. Their only interest is flirting and mating, and that's it. Um, and so much like a firework, their display is beautiful but brief, uh, usually lasting. Um, the whole firefly season only lasts a couple months, and an individual firefly might only live a couple weeks. Um, and so often when you go out and look at fireflies, and it, it differs in different areas, but at least around here, um, you'll see something like this. Um, this is a time-lapse shot, um, which just kind of indicates, I think, the utter chaos that uh, a large number of fireflies will produce. A hugely chaotic scene where you have flashes going everywhere and you like don't really know what's going on. And um, what causes this is often you get a lot of firefly species in the same place. And these firefly species, they want to make sure that they're only looking for fireflies of their species. And so they have to find a way of distinguishing themselves from others. And the way that they do that is individual species will adopt species specific flash patterns, the males will, as they fly around. And so if you have a bunch of species in the same habitat, you might find um, that they kind of separate into different sort of patterns. And so the most common firefly does this beautiful single flash and a little J shape. It's very characteristic. You don't get those in New Hampshire though, so you may never have seen it. Um, although there's another species that does something similar, but, um, and then you get species that do flash trains where they have, you know, three to maybe up to eight flashes all in a row and then a period of darkness. And, and then again, um, all sorts of things. There's a lot of variation and they use this variation to sort of say, you know, this is me, I'm this species. Don't confuse me for anyone else. And I'm only looking for single ladies of my species. Um, I wanted to show a brief video to kind of give you an idea apart from you know, the chaos, what is actually happening to produce these displays? And so this is a video that shows a Photinus pyralis male. He's gonna be shown right here. He does a J-shaped flash and then he waits three, four, five, six seconds and does another one. And then one, two, three, four, five, he does one off screen and then one, two, three, four, five, six, he does another one. And so they are really, really, really stereotyped in this behavior because the length of the flash and the length of this, the silence between flashes means something. And so they, they work really hard to get it right. What I also like about this video, I hope you guys can tell, is that when you follow an individual male, you can almost see at the end of each flash, he sort of hovers for a bit, and it almost seems like he's looking for something and he is looking for something. He's looking for somebody to text him back, if you will, <laughs> or to, to answer his advertisement. And that would be a female firefly on the ground who flashes back with her own sort of response. And if everything goes well, they find each other and they make um, hundreds of beautiful firefly children and the species you know, perpetuates for many generations to come. Unfortunately, segue, as we have gradually light, lit up our night, um, going from something like this to, you know, with the prol proliferation of very cheap LEDs, we've decided we can just put lights everywhere, even on this tree for some reason. I don't understand it. Um, but as we've continued to do this, and the Milky Way has faded from view, fireflies too have disappeared from many places where they were once found. The goal of my research is to find out if this is correlation or causation, and if artificial light is causing firefly declines, what can we do about it? For many years, firefly researchers like myself, my advisor Sarah Lewis, um, and others have advocated the use of firefly-friendly light sources when out in the field 
And that means colors of light that fireflies can't see very well or don't react to. We just can't seem to agree on what that color is. Um, so red, amber, and blue are all options. And one of my goals with the study I'm going to talk about um, for the end of this talk uh, is was to settle this question once and for all. And to do that, I took a 10 hour road trip from Tufts University to Kellettville, Pennsylvania, which is a very nice dark sky area. I mean, about as good as you're gonna get in Pennsylvania, um, where you know there's not a lot of light pollution. There's, there's not a lot of development in general, but there are a lot of insects, including fireflies. And in fact, um, the Black Caddis Ranch where I stayed has so many fireflies that every year they host the Pennsylvania Firefly Festival, which attracts people from all around the globe come to see a very special firefly, my study species for this experiment, um, called uh, the synchronous firefly, species name Photinus carolinus. Males of this species will flash all together about um, five to eight times, and then they wait a solid eight seconds of full darkness, um, during which the females can respond if they want, and then they begin again, the sort of, sort of cycle begins again. Play it one more time so you can really appreciate it. So it's like total synchrony and then total darkness and then it all repeats. It's, I mean, the video doesn't even do it justice. It's a stunning display and it's following a full day of fun insect related activities that make the $5 entrance fee really, really worth it. Um, so these fireflies come out very late at night around 10 p.m. and they are in the deep dark woods. So festival visitors need light to guide them to the viewing areas unless, you know, because nobody wants somebody to fall in the river or get eaten by a bear. Um, and also though, we don't want to impact the firefly display or the firefly habitat more generally, right? We want people to be able to enjoy this for generations to come. So what do you do? Um, the question is red light or blue light? Um, so, we already know based on a lot of previous research that I'd be happy to talk to you about um, that white light makes male fireflies flash less. But there are a lot more aspects to this particular situation that we needed to figure out. I wanted to know um, how does light affect synchronous fireflies? This is a unique way of being a firefly and are they more or less vulnerable to artificial light? What colors of light are the most disruptive and the least disruptive? Can we find a color that just doesn't bother them that much? How do these colors of light affect other insects in the habitat? Because it's not just a firefly zone, right? It's an ecosystem and we wanna protect the whole thing. So um, to answer these questions, here's what I did. Um, this is a map, this is the bed and breakfast where we stayed. Um, the Pennsylvania Firefly Festival happens sort of up this path and in these woods up here. Um, we worked along this forest edge and we set up four plots with a pole in the middle of each and we suspended LED floodlights from that pole of three colors, red, amber, and blue. And then there was a, a dark control. They were all equally bright, except for the dark one, obviously. <laughs> and the order of the treatments was randomized each day. So each day we'd go out and shift these bulbs around. Um, so another view, just to give you a sense. So this is the forest edge and here's our four plots. Um, at each individual plot, we divided it up into four subplots. So we could see sort of at varying distances from the forest edge, what was going on. The reason we wanted to do this, I should mention is that Photinus carolinus is a forest species. So they were kind of concentrated in here, but they spilled out into the lawn. And so there's a gradient of firefly activity that we wanted to capture. And so, um, did I, yeah. And so we did that with these little four grids where we basically went out and surveyed fireflies. More specifically, um, two hours each night, 10 p.m. to midnight, me and one other very lucky soul. Um, we visited every single plot twice in random order. We visited every single subplot twice, all of these in random order. And at each subplot, we stood there for 60 seconds and just counted the number of flash patterns that we saw produced within that subplot during that minute. Um, and we also put sticky traps underneath each light. Oh, there's a firefly coming in. We also put sticky traps underneath each light to um, measure how many moths and other insects these lights attracted. 
Whew, okay, and here is what we found. So um, before I actually show the data, I wanna orient you to this graph. It's really not as bad as it looks, I promise. Um, so now we have the forest edge we're gonna pretend is on the left. This is where the fireflies are coming from. And then we have our four subplots, which are at varying distances from the forest edge. And then at each plot, we put a light about here. So there's a light in the middle. And we're sort of measuring at each of these four spots, how many fireflies do we see flashing? And how does that change based on the color of the light that's there? And so, um, like I said, the fireflies in the forest sort of spilled out into the fields. So we might expect kind of a, a line going down with more flash patterns per minute observed near the forest and then fewer near the field over here. Uh, and that is actually what we saw. So we saw about one, <laughs> when you do have the math, it's like not very impressive. One flash pattern per minute. There were a lot of hours spent counting nothing, but that's kind of normal for ecology. Um, so we got one flash pattern per minute near the forest. And then as you get out closer, you know, into the field, they fall off. There's just not as many fireflies there. Now, when we added light over here, we saw something very different. So an amber light just absolutely destroyed uh, the firefly flash activity. We very rarely saw any fireflies flash under amber light. The only ones that did were really right up next to the forest edge, maybe where it was a bit shadier, kind of nice, a little bit darker, and they could hide a bit from the light. Um, and then the red and blue colors of light fell in the middle. We couldn't really tell a difference between them. They were definitely better than amber, but worse than dark. Um, so that's the first half of the experiment. How does light affect fireflies? Okay, seems to have an impact. How does, these, how does this light affect other insects in the habitat? Um, so this is just all of the insects that we trapped on our sticky traps under our lights. And in darkness, we got about 50. So these insects weren't attracted to anything. <laughs> they were just passing by. They were very unlucky. Um, and it sort of shows how many insects there really were at the site that we could catch 50 just by putting out a little square sheet of sticky paper, basically. Um, so uh, under blue and amber light, though, we caught a lot more, which means the insects were really coming to these lights and getting stuck on these traps very predictably. Under red light, we got about half as much. Um, so, and these are just the various um, types of insect. This is <laughs> really maybe unnecessary, unnecessarily technical. Uh, all the blue things were types of flies. So like mosquitoes, gnats, drain flies, that's uh, psychota day. We got so many drain flies or drain moths. It's just like, <laughs> and then we didn't actually get many actual moths. Um, that's Lepidoptera here, not very many. Um, and then these are uh, true bugs. So like leaf hoppers mostly. Um, in case you're wondering, we did also catch at least three Photinus carolinus fireflies. We got one on amber, one on red and two on blue for whatever that's worth. It's not very many. Okay, so what does this all mean? Ah, uh, look, it is the constellation Lampyridae. Hmm? Um, to summarize, does light affect the flash activity of synchronous fireflies? Yeah, it seems to affect them a lot. Uh, what colors of light are the most and least disruptive? Well, they're all pretty bad, but amber is definitely the worst, right? Based on what we saw. Okay, how do these colors of light affect other insects in the area? Um, amber and blue were actually about equally bad, which may surprise some of you that um, have studied insect flight to light behavior. I have an explanation. I won't get into it <laughs> unless you ask. Um, but then red was the least bad of the bunch. And so if you put sort of these two things together, then red light would come out on top. It's the winner. I guess darkness is the real winner, but red light is the runner up. Um, and then amber is the worst, which is really unfortunate because the amber LED is increasingly touted as the environmentally friendly solution that we've all been waiting for. Good for your circadian rhythm, good for dark skies, good for baby sea turtles, doesn't attract insects, except it does. And the point that I'm trying to make here is, Excuse I've me. misled you all because I don't think we're going to find a magical color of light that only humans can see that has no other environmental impacts. And I think that color is a distraction from the real issue which is brightness. Um, simply put, 
animals that can't see amber or can't see red can still see an ultra bright amber or red light because color perception is all about probabilities. If you have a one in a million chance of seeing an amber photon and your LED headlight puts out a billion trillion amber photons, you know, you can do the math, you're still going to see something. Um, and so because of this, um, this, this work and this growing realization inspired me to collaborate with the Xerxes Society for Invertebrate Conservation. I have a link to this PDF, which I will scroll past all your beautiful questions and put in the chat. Um, uh, so I worked with Xerxes on this um, guide to firefly friendly lighting, which secret is actually a guide to earth friendly lighting, planet friendly lighting, because I really tried to emphasize um, the major takeaway, which is just don't, just don't do it. If you don't put out light, nothing goes wrong. And the moment you start trying to sort of, you know, bargain is where you start to have issues. And so our basic recommendations, you know, we try to really highlight that, you know, number one, just remove lights that aren't doing anything. You know, aesthetics are very nice. And if you're not near a natural area, sure, I'm not going to complain about it. But if you're near firefly habitat or you want to protect nearby natural spaces, you don't need to light up your trees. You just don't. Um, and then, you know, other lights, turn them off when you're not using them. Um, ideally, you would install motion activators that turn them off for you when you're not around. We don't need to have, well, let me scroll back because actually, if you think about it, this, um, this image is like kind of infuriating. No one is here. <laughs> no one is here. We do not need to light up this road when no one is there. Um, it's just, you know, it's not helping anybody and it's just so harmful. Um, and then timers can also do that. Turn your lights on, off when you're not around or not gonna be using them. And then if you have to have light, then we start bargaining. And I'd say the first, the first thing I really wanna emphasize is your light should be as dim as you can accept because, um, <sighs> It, everything's super bright these days. LEDs tend to be super bright and we just don't need it. If you can see, you don't need, you know, a billion lumens, you know, just a few will let you find your path and, and navigate safely. Um, if you want to pick a color, red is probably the best. It's just not very many animals can see it. So it does seem like a good option, but a super bright um, red LED is, people can still see it. You can still see it. Um, Oh yes, somebody said, I have the chat open, this is good. So dark adaptation, that's the thing. Uh, not to get too into it, but um, when I go out to watch fireflies, I go out at dusk and I stand out there for like an hour and your eyes take about 30 minutes to adapt to darkness. And it takes about 30 minutes for the sun to set. So when you're out there, you don't actually notice it getting very dark until it's like, oh wow, it's night. Um, and if you, if I'm out there, you know, the whole night, I never turn on a light and, you know, it's an open area, there's stars and maybe a little bit of a moon, you would be surprised what you can see. The issue is that most people are, you know, in their houses, everything's brightly lit. They're fully light adapted. They have full color vision. And if they step outside in that instant, it's going to be really hard to see anything. But if you're patient and you wait, you will become dark adapted. You will become able to navigate at night. We do have this ability as humans. Um, nocturnal, like fully dark adapted vision is um, black and white. It's you're colorblind at night. And so it's just fun to think, I mean, how often do you really use your black and white night vision? Probably not that much. And if you let your eyes adapt and you try to use it, you will be surprised what you can see. So I'm a, a bit of a Puritan when I go out, I very rarely use any lights at all, um, but, you know, if I have people with me, I want them to feel comfortable. I would recommend sort of red headlamps, red flashlights that are really dimmed to the lowest acceptable intensity. And that doesn't take a lot of money. You can cover a light with paper tape or painter's tape, you know, computer paper, whatever you want um, to sort of dim it. And as long as it's not an older lighting type, it won't light on fire. LEDs are very energy efficient. Uh, and then the other thing is shielding. Um, but I think shielding, it's a really great thing for people who love dark skies a shielded light still affects everything that's below it. So it's not like my, you know, top priority. You know, if I were going to give an example of the best possible lighting, it would be this um, here. This is a development next to a bat reserve um, in the Netherlands. And you can see they have these pretty dim red. So I won't emphasize color, <laughs> dim 
well shielded LEDs um, that are only used where and when they are needed. And these lights are red. And so if a light can be red, you know, all the better, right? I don't think that's the top priority. And in most cases, a lot of these, you know, fine details, optimizations don't need to be the priority because as I'm sure you'll start to notice if you go out at night and have this on your mind, in the world of light pollution, there is a lot of low hanging fruit. Like here, this is a nature reserve right next to my house. And it's home to four species of firefly, or at least it was last time I checked. You know, we'll see what happens if I can't convince these businesses to invest in curtains. Um, and so with that, I wanna thank um, a bunch of my funding sources and also all of you for listening. Um, if you have any questions that I don't get to in the Q&A, this is my email and you can find me on Twitter. Um, and also I'm really happy to answer your questions now. Thank you so much. That was really informative. And um, but we've got someone volunteering to write to them if you do a letter writing campaign. I'm assuming she um, or they mean this this business. So if you launch an effort. Oh yeah, I did write I did write a, an op ed which I tried to. It's a develop it's a developer. And what's funny is this is a whole complex, and part of the complex is like an astronomical organization. <laughs> it's like, um, I did write an op-ed uh, and I was really hoping that some changes would be made. You can see the link there. Uh, I haven't visited it recently. Who knows? Maybe it's totally better. I'll let you know. Um, so one of the questions there was, I live in a small town in New Hampshire and there's been a lot of discussion in recent years about our, our, um, our vintage street lights that went in in the early days of electricity in town. And there was a lot of heated discussion about um, whether we should replace them with LEDs for energy efficiency. There was a lot of discussion about kind of the character of the town and the historic nature of the lights. And there was also a lot of discussion about safety. And I wonder, you know, how do you respond to people that say we need these lights in all of our streets um, for, for safety's sake? Is there yeah. a middle ground or what's your answer to that? Absolutely. A hard hitting question right off the bat. <laughs> um, so first of all, in terms of lighting types, I do always advocate for LEDs because they're energy efficient. I mean, there's just no way to justify a light that like is polluting the atmosphere, carbon emissions and all that. Um, and LEDs can be whatever color you want. They can be as dim as you want. We, they just tend to be super bright and super blue for historical reasons, but we have the technology like we can fix that problem. Um, safety is an interesting topic. I would say for the vast majority of the time, it's okay. If, if it's in the middle of a city, it's highly urban. There's not going to be animals there anyway. It's not a big deal. I'm not going to like fight for the right to deprive people of feeling safe in their houses. Like I'm just not, um, there's a lot of like natural places where, you know, you're not even supposed to be at night anyways, that really don't need to be lit when people aren't there. And that's why I think motion detectors are so powerful. They're not that expensive and they just turn the lights on when you need them and they turn them off when you're gone. Um, and I think that's just, if every, if every light on the planet was a motion detector, I would not complain, even if there were a ton of them because at least they were being used. Um, but the low hanging fruit is stuff like, you know, these windows, nobody's using that light. That doesn't benefit anybody. Um, and so I don't think you can really justify that. Okay, so there was one question for about um, common species in North Texas. Do you know anything about those fireflies? Who you got a? There's a lot of fireflies in Texas. There's a whole website, isn't it? Firefly.com or firefly.org is created by Ben Pfeiffer in Texas, I think. Um, I'm not an expert. <laughs> I've never been. Uh, I've never seen them, but they would be different than the ones we have here. And probably what you get a lot of is Photinus pyralis, um, that, that J-shaped flasher. They are the most common species in the U.S. We don't get them up here, so they seem kind of rare to me, but they're actually like the vast majority of species that you get in the South. Although you also get some very rare things. And in fact, um, my advisor and I have been working we, we worked to establish an IUCN firefly specialist group to red list some firefly species. 
And um, the ones that keep coming up are these like sort of rare, you know, desert type species where they have these really arid environments in like Arizona and they're very rarely seen and they uh, sure do seem to be in need of protection. Um, another question is, you know, in, in terms of light pollution, like obviously an office building, like what you're showing in this slide has a really huge impact. Has, is there anything about, you know, do our individual homes, especially in rural areas, um, is that also? That's a great question. Impact? Is it, is it less of an impact? Um, should we be thinking <laughs> about this in, in more isolated rural areas where a lot of the Harris Center folks might be? That's a great question. I love this. Um, so I would actually say, unfortunately, rural homes are, are pro is probably the most damaging because you know what? All the animals in that environment are not used to light. And so when we talk about, you know, moths not flying to lights anymore, they've learned over generations not to do it. When you put a light into a rural area, that's probably the first time that many of the species there have seen it. And so they're going to act in all sorts of weird ways. And, you know, Again, so I do think the closer you are to nature, the more concerned you should be about your lighting. You're not sort of going to increase sky glow and you're not going to show up on my big map of light pollution, but you could do a lot of harm locally and not even know it. And especially if, you know, if you're asleep at night, you know, you don't really need to have a, a porch light on when you're not there. Um, and so those are sort of, yeah, I, I do kind of feel like that that's an area, if you live in a rural area, you have a chance to either do a lot of damage or do a lot of good by lighting your space responsibly. That's a great answer. Um, Nina's, Nina is saying, during bird migrations, we're often encouraged to turn off lights outside. Could that be a good synergy to kind of leverage with Audubon? It, yes. Um, so um, I've been really, yeah, no, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I'm just really excited about this. So the bird migration people have had huge success. Um, this is the work of Kyle Horton, Benjamin Van Doren, and a few others, I think, um, where they've sort of done these like incredible maps of how birds are traveling and shown that when you have lights on in a city, you get a lot of bird strikes, birds, um, for whatever reason, seem attracted to lights and then they'll run into windows. It's one of these weird, kind of similar to insect flight to light behavior, but a little bit different. Um, and so they do these campaigns to turn off lights during the migration season. And I think that's great. And the only comment I have about it is, why can't we just turn them off all the time? You know, the birds are passing through, but things live there. You know, they could probably, if we can do it some of the time, why not all the time? But I think it's just incredible that people are actually paying attention to this as an issue, finally. Um, and I, I can see, I can imagine that we're going to make a lot of progress within my lifetime on this issue. I love your hopeful outlook. Um, another question from Nina, are there different times of night that different species are more active? Yes. If oh. you only turn off lights when you go to bed, for instance, around 11, will other species be affected differently? This is a fabulous question. I didn't really get a time, get time to talk about it, but now I will. Um, so when I mentioned that you tend to get a lot of species in one spot, um, these species will try to use flash pattern to distinguish themselves from each other, but there's like only so many ways you can blink on and off. And so another method that a lot of them have sort of ended up using is splitting up the night into blocks. And it's really obvious if you go out and pay attention that you get a certain species right at dusk and it comes out, flies around for about 30 minutes and then it goes to bed. And then you get another species that comes out, is out for about 30 minutes and goes to bed. And then round three is usually a nocturnal species that comes out and is out most of the night. And so they do kind of partition the night like this. And I haven't studied a ton of fully nocturnal species besides Phytinus carolinus, um, but I have a, a theory that um, how nocturnal or sort of dusk active you are determines how much you are affected by light pollution because the dusk active fireflies are used to flying around and flashing when it's light out more or less. And so they might be more resilient to it, whereas the fully nocturnal ones can be really sort of disrupted by artificial light in their environment. And as sort of anecdotal evidence of this, I have a general sense that in uh, the city around where I live, you see a lot more dusk active species than fully nocturnal species. The fully nocturnal species are sort of more, you should go further out to find them. And that could be why 
It could even be the case that some dusk active species are taking advantage of light pollution and using it to stay out later and keep flashing and doing their thing. Um, in which case, you know, good for them, but the nocturnal species are hurting because of it. Okay, it's the last call for any questions. We do have a couple minutes left if anyone has um, a burning question about fireflies or light or Avalon, if there's anything, I guess here's a question. My last question is, what, what um, did you wish that you had time to talk about, but you know, you kind of cut out from your talk for time. Is there one, one more thing you really want to leave us with? Oh boy. Okay. Yes, actually. Okay. Um, so all of the research that I've talked about and many, uh, all of the research in the field um, for many, many centuries has been very biased, which is because most people, when they study fireflies, are only looking at the males. The males are easy to see, they're flashy, they're bright, they're interesting, but biologically speaking, they are not all that important. It's the females on the ground who decide sort of what's going to happen. Are these, are these two going to mate? Will there be a next generation? And so real quickly, I have done a lab study on this very question, um, which is pretty simple where basically I have a little container in the lab and it's got two parts and they're see-through. Um, and I put a male on the top and I put a female on the bottom. This is a different species, one that's um, found around here. Um, and I basically let these two start talking to each other. He flashes, she responds, he flashes, she responds. And then I turn on a light and I see what happens. Does the male keep flashing? Does the female still respond? Question mark. And I've tried a whole bunch of different colors of light and real fast, these are my results. So the, the bar, these are box plots. So the middle bar shows like, it's the median, it's like the mean, the average pretty much. Um, and I found that males will flash about 10 times a minute in darkness and under basically cool white, warm white, blue, amber or red light, they flash about half as much. And it doesn't really seem to matter whether the light is bright or dim. I did try like bright light and dim light. That doesn't make a huge difference. And this is kind of in line with what we know. White, you know, light makes fireflies flash less. Okay, the male fireflies, what about the females? This is where it gets interesting. The females are way more sensitive because, you know, in darkness, they respond to males about 100% of the time. The male flashes, she flashes back, she's into it. Um, under light, it falls dramatically. Um, for example, we never saw a female respond to a male under bright amber light. Um, the most we got was like 50% under red light and dim red light, dim red light that like I could barely see. I was shocked that it still had an effect. Um, and this could be because the light's pointing down, the female's looking up. And so she's like staring right at it and she just might be blinded by it. Could also be that the female's looking up, she sees the light. When a male flashes against the light, he's harder to see, or maybe he just doesn't look that good because fireflies um, think brighter flashes are sexier. And if his flash is sort of, not, doesn't have a lot of contrast, it might not look very handsome. And so she might decide to wait until she finds another guy. Um, and then, so the females are being really choosy under light and then the males sort of swap from like a general excited flashing a bunch mode to like a sad dejected uh, there's no one around talking to me kind of mode and that's could be the reason that we see this pattern so female fireflies very important understudied to date but i'm trying to get them more coverage in the scientific literature oh that's fascinating so well thank you so much to everyone for joining us and to avalon for sharing um your fascinating research with us and i hope we will all go forth and turn out some lights so thank you so much for having me and um, see you next time